John chapter 13. 1 through 5 and then 12 through 17. In a few minutes, I just want to draw our attention to some lessons God has been teaching me in this short time in ministry. Watch verse number 1. Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour was come, that he should depart out of this world into the Father. Watch this, Brother Jordan. Having loved his own, which were in the world, he loved them unto the end. Now that's proper motive right there. Verse 2, and supper being ended, the devil, having now put in the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things, I want you to watch this, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hand, and that he was come from God and went to God, he knew that. There was no doubt. He is God. He is God. Verse 4. He rises from supper. <laughs> That's God Almighty. He rises from supper. Lay aside his garment. And took a towel. Girdled himself. Girdled himself. After that he poured water into a basin. And God himself began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with a towel wherewith he was girded. Look with me from verse number 12. So after he had washed their feet and had taken his garment and was sat down again, he said unto them, Know ye what I've done to you? Ye call me Master and Lord, and ye say, Well, for so I am. Again, he's God. If I then, your Lord and Master, have washed your feet, ye ought also to wash one another's feet. For I've given you an example that you should do as I've done to you. Verily I say unto you, the servant is not greater than his Lord, small l-o-r-d. Neither he that is sent greater than he that sent him. Verse 17. If you know these things. Happy are ye if you do them. Our Father, please help me. God, I know it's not by might or one of presentation or illustrations or the outlines, but God, we know that it's by your spirit that you will take the principles of your word and Open our eyes and open our hearts and help us to apply them to our lives. I pray that you'd wash and cleanse and purge. I pray you hide me behind the cross. Yes. Honor, exalt yourself, bind the enemy. Yes. Do your work tonight and all the praise, honor, and glory be thine. We ask in Christ's name and for his sake. Amen. Amen. One of the most interesting man or character in the New Testament is a man by the name of Epaphroditus. Epaphroditus' story can be found in Philippians chapter 2 25 through 30. Epaphroditus is interesting because he was a rare individual, unique individual. Epaphroditus was a servant. Yep. 
That text in Philippians tells us that Epaphroditus served the Apostle Paul. It's in verse 25. Epaphroditus was very sick. But still, he was worried about the believers at Philippi. Because he knew they worried about him in verse 26. Paul goes on to tell us a little more about him concerning his sickness. That Epaphroditus became sick because he was a servant to the Apostle Paul. <laughs> that phrase, he regardeth not his life, is very interesting in Philippians. It is used as a gambling term. It means to recklessly expose one life to danger. Not regarding his life. I want to read that again. It means to recklessly exposing one's life to danger. In gambling term, it means to risk everything on the throw of a dice. Epaphroditus willingly placed his life on the line to serve Paul, the man of God. Yeah. He gambled everything for Jesus, man, for God's man. Epaphroditus was a servant. You know, I read the story of Epaphroditus and I ask myself, where did he get that from? Where did that come from? What did Jordan talk about? A love. I believe Epaphroditus got that from the Lord himself, Jesus Christ. In the text before us, Epaphroditus um, Jesus Christ, on the eve of his death, Jesus is about to go to the cross right. to take our sins upon him. Right. Jesus Christ took the place of the lowest of the lowest of servants. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. In that day, these servants, Brother Wheeler was called the people of the tower. Yeah. Their job was to wash the feet of the superior ones. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Jesus Christ, God Himself, took the position of the lowest of the lowest if you could term it slaves well, amen. and I've been thinking about that in my life concerning my service As you examine the text, I want us to keep in mind that as we look at Jesus, who is our greatest example, you and I have to learn from his labor, from his work. When he rose from supper, wrapped a towel around his body, and washed the feet of his disciples, Again, I want to remind us he's performing the act of a selfless servant. Mm -hmm. <laughs> he's serving his men. <laughs> mm. 
what Jesus did, some principles I believe should help us as we serve him. Let me rephrase that. Should help me as I serve him and as I serve others. He wants me to become a true servant. There are several factors, I believe, that present themselves as you look at this. Washing feet was literally slaves' work. As you examine that and study that a little, you realize even the lowest of the Jewish people were not allowed to do that. It was a task reserved for the lowest of Gentiles' slave. The lowest. Jesus, a friend of sinners. Jesus, God himself. Humble himself to meet the needs of those he loved. Jesus washed the feet of his disciples without being told to do so. In fact, the disciples were shocked. They were amazed that their master wanted to wash their feet. And you remember what Peter said? He said, Lord, you can't do that. That's beneath you. That's below you. You are the master. You can't, I, I, I can't let you wash my feet. Chapter 6, verse 8. Really, in context, and if you turn to Luke chapter 7, verse 40 through 50, the woman who washed his feet, dried her hair, Christ was literally rebuking them, he said, this woman washed my feet when you were supposed to give me water to wash my feet and people to wash my feet. That was the tradition with the Jews. Yeah, right. It was a breach of hospitality. The disciples really should have been doing this for the master. But the disciples were waiting for somebody to do that for them like I do a lot of times. Jesus Christ served with no expectation of reward. No one ever said to him, thank you. He did it because he wanted to. I want to say that again. And that got me. He did it because he wanted to. Amen. Jesus Christ served those who did not deserve to be served. I want to think about that for a while. He washed the feet of Simon Peter. <laughs> Simon Peter, before the night would end, these feet would stand in the courts of Rome. And these feet and hands would be warmed by the fire. He knew that. Yet he washed his feet. He knew Peter would deny him. 
In fact, Peter used, I believe, a lot of curse words. And I think I said that one time. What would you do if a cursing preacher? Not just Peter. And again, maybe not for you, but as a reminder to me, <laughs> Jesus Christ washed the feet of Judas. <laughs> now he's God, he knows everything. He knew that Judas' feet had already carried him to the Jewish leader to make a bargain to sell him. That's before supper. Jesus knew that. Before the night would be ended, Judas would come back. And kiss the master to identify him. That's amazing. Amen. But he washed the feet of Judas. There is a quotation that I wrote down here until you sit at meal with those who betray you. You've not really understood betrayal. What would you do if you knew somebody would sell you out? How would you treat that person? If you know they would deny ever knowing you, would you still sit at supper with them? Or would you get on Facebook and expose them? You know, it has to take the grace of God in our lives. Yeah. Amen. Brother Will, I us to get that. He sits at supper with someone who'll sell him. He knew that. Yet he treated him as if nothing happened. Yet he loved him. I believe when he washed his feet, it was an opportunity for Judas to repent. Opportunities upon opportunities. <laughs> Jesus washed the feet of the other disciples. Yeah. He knew before the night they would run. Yeah. Abandon him. Jesus knew all of these things, yet... He became a slave, a servant to them. <laughs> There's the other side to that preacher. When Jesus was washing their feet, Luke 22, 24 through 30 told us of a discussion that was taking place at supper. I don't know about you, but it shows our hearts. Maybe not you, but it shows where I am at. You know what we're talking about? And just so that you get it, let's turn to Luke. <laughs> 22. It's an amazing thing. Look at verse 24. 
there was also a strife among them of which of them should be accounted the greatest. And he said unto them, the kings of the Gentiles exercise lordship over them. And they that exercise authority upon them are called benefactors, but you shall not be so. But he that is the greatest among you, let him be as the younger. And he that is chief, as he that serve. He's about to go to the cross. He's burdened because he knows that the Father will turn his back on him. He knows the pain. He goes to the garden actually and sweat like blood. But his disciples were debating about who would replace him. Who's the greatest? Isn't that how our ministry is today? About who has the biggest ministry? How many souls that you've won to Christ? Who has the biggest building? Who is the most influential? Who has the best house? Who has the best suits? Who has the biggest salary? Are you thinking that's crazy? Who'd become the next pastor of this church? So many wonderful churches, the great work of God have been destroyed. Yeah. <laughs> Brother Wheeler, because men can't stand up. Men cannot put our wives where it ought to and say, no, this is God's man. You ought not to bring these accusations. And uh, men get in a scrubble in the church fighting for position. Yeah. Who's the next pastor? <laughs> Who will take over? Maybe praying for the pastor to die. Be careful about that. I found myself, brother, and uh, I know you mean it well. I found myself sometimes saying, that's harsh, that's bad, that should never happen. And next few days, the same thought came into my heart. Could I share something with you? You know. I had a wonderful conversation with Brother Sam. I know he's not watching now. He's at church. He should be at church. <laughs> and knowing Brother Sam, he's at church. Faithful brother. And over the years, Brother Will and myself had our disagreements. And uh, Brother Sam was watching last night. And he said to me, I saw your friend preaching. He said, yeah. He said, Pastor, when you went to D.C., I was praying that you'd gone to see Brother Wheeler. I said, Brother Sam, I did. That's what Brother Sam said to me. He said, Preacher, I've been praying for a long time. But he never told me that. Brother Sam never one time has undermined me. Never. Never. 
my biggest, one of my strongest supporters, Brother Sam. Yes. Faithful. The summer has gone to another level. <sighs> really, truthfully, we are all just but God's servants. Right. Slaves. Laborers together. You and I must be willing to humble ourselves and do whatever it takes or necessary. To serve others. Philippians chapter 2 and verse 4. Could I share something with you? If God did not think of reputation, if God did not think of who he is but humble himself, became flesh, to save us and serve us. The Bible says God have highly exalted him. We must learn to serve. Oh, let me rephrase that. I must learn to serve without being asked to do so. There is so much to be done in the work of God. For the Christian, there is so much to be done. And yet it is said, is it 10% or 5% of the church does everything? And the other person just sits down and criticizes tear down. You know why God is allowing you to see something that needs to be done in the church? So you'd get up and do it. You know why God is allowing you to see somebody's fault? It's not for you to gossip about it. Or think yourself better than the person. But go help the person. There is so much to be done in this work. The potential for this work is huge. Beyond your imagination. And I know you all guys have it. I know, I know, I know, I know. We must learn to serve others without no thought of reward. I'm very careful. Preacher, I thank God for you. I thank God for this church. I thank you for what you guys are doing. But my love in you should not be so what I can get. A lot of people love for what they can get. But when the getting is done, the love is gone. It's dried up. I know that firsthand. And I say to myself, God, help me to serve you without the physical rewards. Prosperity preaching has messed up so many people. So we think that if I'm serving God, I must drive the best vehicle, I must have the best of all that stuff. If I'm going to do something, I have to get something in return. 
that spirit, that attitude yeah. is from children. Yeah. Children, <laughs> you ask your child to do that. What do I get? Sometimes as adults, maybe not you, but sometimes I find myself behaving like that. I have to learn to serve without no thought of reward. And God is no debtor to anyone. <laughs> you and I must learn to serve. I don't want to say it, but it's the word of God. I have to learn to serve those who are selfish and refuse to serve. How about loving those folks who, who don't love you and despitefully use you? You know, somebody said this. I pray and ask God to use me and he begins to use me by other people using me and I get upset. I get upset. I get angry. You know Jesus Christ fed the multitude. Yes, when he preached, a lot of them left. But he fed them. He knew they had selfish ambitions. He knew they had selfish goals. You and I must learn. God help me as a pastor. I'll be 63 in September. But I must learn to teach the next generation by encouraging them to serve as they see me serve. You know, I sat during this camp meeting, the Jubilee, and I said to Brother Wheeler, I said, look at Sister Annette, watch her, preacher's wife. And, and I, know, I know that's embedded in you. Everybody was eating, but she's, she's serving. What example you guys have? Maybe you didn't hear me. What example you guys have? She stays behind the scenes. God will bless you. I know he has blessed you already. Not just his labor, I need to hurry on, but we must learn from his lordship. You know, again, I want to emphasize that he is God. God himself rose from supper. He rose from his fellowship with God, the Father, the Son, and the Spirit in heaven. To serve. God himself laid out his outer garments. He'd already laid it aside in heaven. He became a nobody. Just a baby in the manger. Jesus Christ himself, God himself, girded himself a towel. The word refers, that word towel refers to a knotted cloth or literally a slave's service apron. That's what he put on. He already robbed himself of his deity. He condescend to us. Jesus 
poured water into a basin to clean up the dirty feet of his disciples, his men. But it pretty soon poured his blood to clean out my dirty sin. Preach, what are you trying to do? I'm trying to get us to understand and to see that this is God incarnate. Yeah. Colossians 1.16 All things were created by him. Yeah. All things. Yeah. John 1.1 1, 1, The beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. Yeah. All things were created by him. This is the savior, this is the redeemer, this is the deliverer of lost sinners. <laughs> let's, let's go to a scripture passage. Revelation chapter 1, and, and, and the preacher dealt with that a little. And, and when he was doing that, I said, wow, but look at that. Revelation chapter 1. I, I want us to understand, that's him. Yeah. Yeah. That's him. John said in verse number 10, I was in the spirit on the Lord's day. I heard a preacher explain all of that stuff. He said in verse 11, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. Yep. Verse 12, and I turned to see the voice that speak with me, and I being turned, I saw what? Seven golden candlesticks. In the midst of the seven golden candlesticks, one stood, one like unto the Son of Man, clothed with garment down to the feet and girded with pulp paps and a golden candle and his hair, his head and his hair was white like wool as white as snow and his eyes was a flame of fire his feet like a defined brass yeah. as if they burn in the furnace and his voice as the sound of many waters that's him yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. that's him that's him in John chapter 13. <laughs> Revelation chapter 19, verse 16. This is the King of kings and Lord of lords. So I want to ask us tonight. If the King of kings and Lord of God could condescend to serve the disciples. <coughs> what excuse do we have? Why can't we humble ourselves to serve others? Why is, Brother Wheeler, why is that constant strive? Why? And I understand differences. I understand that. But why can't we get along? Why are we always fighting? When the real enemy is out there. The devil. He's our enemy. Not the brother or sister seated next to you in the church. Not your wife or your husband. This humbles me. We are never more like Christ than when we are serving each other. When we humble ourselves and assume the position of a slave before others, we demonstrate true Christ-likeness and God is glorified. Maybe not you, but I know that. One more thing. So you look again back to our text, John chapter 13. I want you to see something. Look at verse number 17. Could it be, Pastor Foster, that's why we have no joy? Yeah. 
if you know these things, happy are ye if you do them. I want to close with this. Go back to verse number one. And the ending part of verse number one says, having departed out of this world unto the Father. Watch this. Having loved his own which were in the world, he loved them unto the end. True motive. Why did Christ come down? Why did God become man? Why did God become man and face all the cruelties of men? By the way, they did not kill him. He gave his life. He willingly surrendered his life. They couldn't kill him. They couldn't. Why did he do that? Because he loved us. Could it be that we don't serve because we don't love? Let me phrase that. You, you wonderful people. Could it be that Samuel feel but have a problem with serving because I really don't love? Because if I love, I will serve. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. My problem with service is I don't love. I don't love. What a God who became man to save me. He became poor that I can become rich. If I was the only person on the face of this earth, he would have still come to die for me. By the way, preacher Willa, he knew me. Songwriter said, yet he loved me. He knew all my mess. Yeah. Yet he still loved me. Yeah. You see, brother, it's not really the Isaac he wants, but it's me. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And when I learn to love as he has loved, I have no problems with forgiving. Yeah. I have no problems with humbling myself and serve those who can't serve me and serve the least of the least. God help me. Our oh, Father, thank you so much. What a wonderful time we've had. But God, this is one of my issues. M my issue. The matter of service. And God, sometimes I... I don't want to serve because I I'm not seeing what's coming in. I I'm looking for something. But God, you you've mm -hmm. demonstrated your love to me in setting an example of being the lowest of the lowest of the lowest of a servant. Please help me. Help your people tonight. In Jesus' name. If you enjoyed today's message, head on over to ibcforums.com and click on sermons. And don't forget to check out our other links in the notes section of today's broadcast. As always, thanks for listening.